Welcome to the Spiegel Law Firm podcast where we talk about issues important to people who've been fired or afraid they might be, and we also discuss cutting-edge legal issues in the news. I'm thrilled today to be joined by Michael Ludwig, who is a senior attorney in our office. Uh, very privileged to have him here. Before we get started, just a little bit of legalese. Uh, this is not intended to be legal advice, nor does it create an attorney-client relationship with our firm. If you want one of, some of those things, then you got it. You should go hire a lawyer. All right. So with that said, Mike, uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, yeah, Tom. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the EEO federal sector process. Um, this is the process for uh, federal employees, employees of the federal government who feel like they either who either have been terminated, feel like they might be terminated, feel like they might have been discriminated against or have been discriminated against. And so specifically what I want to talk about is the EEO process and how similar it is to standard litigation that you might have if you file a claim in federal court or state court and what that um, what those steps entail in um, proceeding with a federal EEO complaint. Yeah, and so the first step of an EEO complaint is the informal EEO uh, complaint, which is contact with the EEO representative. So every federal agency has its EEO, and EEO stands for Equal Employment Opportunity um, Office. And so you can, uh, an employee, if you feel like you've been discriminated against um, or retaliated against, or you feel like you might, you know, experience that down the down the road, you can make that report, and that will be a, a informal. Um, complaint that is filed with an EEO supervisor or an EEO point of contact. And then eventually that um, complaint, that will go through I mean, the informal process and they'll go through a type of uh, attempt to uh, resolution, uh, resolve that like counseling. Uh, the agency might conduct an initial counseling session with that complainant to like clarify issues and explore options for like, an informal resolution. And if that is not successful, the next step is to file a formal complaint. And then that formal complaint is um, then submitted to an EEO investigator, and that EEO investigator will then conduct an investigation uh, and produce what's called a report of investigation or an ROI, which is usually a large document that has pretty much all of the evidence that's been collected by the investigator there in that in that time. So that is the standard process of EEO complaint when you get to the point where you get that um, report of investigation, and then at that point. Employees have a, have two different options. They have the option either to request an EEOC hearing, which is essentially asking for a hearing before an administrative judge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that's a separate federal agency that's independent and separate from uh, any other agency's uh, any other federal agency's EEO office. Or the employee can ask for a final agency decision, and that final agency decision is essentially asking the the federal agency to re-review their well, the actions they took or review their previous like, findings in the case and look at the report investigation to do that. I'm sure you probably agree, Tom, that we typically don't advise clients to ask for that um, final agency decision just because we typically don't trust or expect an agency to essentially reverse their decision based on that evidence. We usually go to that EEOC hearing route. And so what I want to talk about specifically was during an EEOC um, hearing, uh, it essentially acts as you would expect litigation to act um, in any private litigation matter, either in federal court or state court. So under that EEOC hearing, um, you'll be assigned an administrative judge. And then the first step will be attending what's called an initial scheduling conference in which the administrative judge reviews the claims that have been uh, in, in the formal complaint and reviews any kind of discovery, essentially if either party wants to exchange documents. And this is how this case begins to look like litigation because federal EEOC cases that ultimately get to the EEOC hearing stage, they will begin with that discovery stage, which is in which both parties have time to uh, request and then exchange documents between each party. So it's additional discovery, additional documents on top of that report of investigation. And at the end of discovery, it's important to note that the agency will then have a chance to file what's called a motion for summary judgment, which is it's a legal motion and it's asking the court or asking the administrative judge to dismiss the case before it gets to the actual EEOC hearing stage. The agency is essentially asking or arguing that there is no real dispute of genuine fact here, there's no genuine dispute of material fact, that even with all these evidence, there's no um, there's no dispute in which the uh, employee could actually be found in their favor in this matter, essentially saying that there's no, there's no way that a reasonable judge could find in the, in the employee's favor. 
And then the job of an employee is to then file an opposition to that and essentially say that there are disputes of material facts, that this matter needs to go before the EEOC hearing, and that it's inappropriate to dismiss the case now because there are real disputes here. And then if the administrative judge denies that motion for summary judgment, then the actual um, EEOC hearing will take place, which will be a either remote or in person, will be a hearing in which witnesses and testimony will be given, evidence can be reviewed. And at the end of that hearing, the EEOC, the administrative judge of the EEOC will make his or her decision. So I just, well, I guess I want to note that because EEO federal sector process can kind of be confusing. And when we talk about going with a formal investigation and requesting an EEOC hearing, it might, at first glance, employees might think, well, okay, I'm going to go through this investigation, get a report of investigation. And then when I request an EEOC hearing, I will the next step will be that hearing itself. I'll be able to present be able to evidence at, at that hearing and move forward with that. But it's important to know, to know that there is that discovery phase, which uh, takes maybe a month or two. And then there's the uh, motion for summary judgment that you can expect from the agency as well. So there's there are, there are steps and costs that are associated with the EEOC hearing in an EEO federal sector case that employees may not realize initially because it's it's not litigation and it isn't you know it's technically not litigation because you're not filing a claim in federal or state court but it acts very similar to it and it has a lot of the same steps as it and the same costs as well because discovery in an eoc hearing is going to be very similar to discovery in in a litigation case there might just be different rules set up by the administrative judge so that's just something i, I want employees to know federal employees to know moving forward in those eo claims that if you want to pursue a formal complaint all the way to the end point that will involve essentially litigation, which will take time and there will be legal expenses as part of that because it's it's set up the same way the litigation would be for federal or state courts. Yeah, I think that's a great point um, that there's a substantial amount of work involved in it um, and time involved in it uh, because it is it's it is a, it is a form of litigation right it is um really the only difference is there's there's different rules set right when you're in federal court yes. and there's a possibility of jury trial but other than that um it's very similar and you know i i always say like it's, it's you know you got to be ready to ready to climb count kilimanjaro right i mean this is not just dipping your toe in the water this is going in, you know, for, for it all. And there's a possibility that you get attorney's fees if you win at the end of it. Uh, but if you lose, then you're out all those fees. So it's something to, you know, when you're in the federal sector process, you know, I mean, of course it happens in the private sector too, but there's more of a demarcation, right? Because you get your EEOC right to sue and then yeah. you can decide whether or not you want to, you know, file in federal court. And, it, and in the federal sector, it's more of a, not quite seamless, but it's a, a slightly a different a different process. Let me ask you this: If you were advising somebody who comes to you with a federal sector issue, and, and let me say federal sector, which is you know, Mike, like you, it's people who work for the federal government, right? So unless you're in the federal government, some cases government contractors, like the rest of us, are in private sector. So if you work for a federal, so, you know, you know if you're federal federal sector. So for those of you listening, like, am I federal sector? Well, you'll know it. If you work for the government, the federal government, you're federal sector. So that's that's what we're talking about here. But let's say somebody comes to you and says, Mike, you know, this has happened to me. I've experienced this wrongful conduct. You know, I don't necessarily want to go full tilt into hearing because I don't know that I'm going to invest that amount. Like, what are my chances of getting some sort of successful resolution you know, through the informal process and through us assume there's mediation available there? you know, uh, through those counseling and kind of mediation sessions. Is that is that a place where cases get resolved? Yeah, Tom, I would say that is a place where cases get resolved. I'll, I'll kind of, I guess, push back on that a little bit because in my experience, the between the informal and the formal stages, that kind of counseling. And a lot of times when clients come to us, they can come to us at, you know, any stage during the informal or formal. There is a chance for, um, you know, mediation and counseling between the informal and the formal stage. Although in my experience, most of the time when a resolution has been um, reached, it's actually after the formal stage has begun of that of the investigation, but before the investigation has ended, before any of these litigation, very similar type uh, situations where we're requesting an EEOC hearing. Because um, you, you talked about a demarcation, the, the, you know, the bigger demarcation for me is kind of the end of that formal investigation and requesting the EEOC uh, hearing, because I have... You know, anytime along the way, um, either doing an informal or formal investigation, 
you know, if, if, if I have a client and I'm in communication with the um, agency's representative, the opposing counsel for that particular federal agency, we can reach out and try to reach a settlement here. And I've done that, so, you know, many times, and, and there's a, a real possibility for that. I note that the most typical scenario time for that is, is during the formal complaint or uh, in when the investigation is going on. And it might even happen after that report of investigation has been gathered, but before the, um, the, actual EOC hearing has been requested, but I would say that, yeah, you, it, it isn't a kind of black and white case in which you either have to file an EEO uh, claim if you're a federal employee and essentially go the full distance, climb Mount Kilimanjaro and see if you can be successful or not file at all because there's no other way to go for it except going for it all. You can certainly um, resolve the case during the age, during the settlement. And actually probably most of my cases with the EEO federal sector do resolve that way. And so, that can happen after the informal session or during the informal session, but typically, in my experience, it usually happens after the formal session, just because the informal session um, is not does not take very long, and then the the timeline between the informal and formal section is only fifteen days. So once your informal section has been concluded and there hasn't been a resolution at that point, your EEO um, point of contact will inform that employee that they have fifteen days to file a formal complaint. And so usually we like to have more time to try to resolve cases. So usually we'll file that formal complaint. And after that's been filed, then we can have more kind of breathing room to be able to negotiate something with the uh, with the federal agency. Yeah, I think that's an important point. So if people are, and this is something that you'll have to, you know, as a as a tender client or client, you have to talk with your attorney about like kind of, and this is a moving target, right? Like, the, you know, the the landscape for settlement can change better sometimes for worse depending on what has happened in the case so you know you as the client you know and it's always your case right you can dismiss at any point you know if you so if you want to you know go through the informal process go through the formal process see if you can get come some kind of resolution but then you decide hey i don't want to you know i'm i, I don't want to climb Count kilimanjaro i've come this far you know i just want to see how it would go then you can you can call it quits at that point so it's not like you're locked in you know, to right. to a definite, you know, headed to trial. There are lots of stops. Yeah. Like being on the metro, right? There are lots of stops along the way that you can get off. Yeah, there's off ramps. And as, as you said, Tom, it can kind of depend on the case and what other, if certain evidence has been, you know, revealed, it might make the employer, employee or employer, the federal government agency more apt to want to settle. Or if there's other evidence, you know, that would make it easier for the case to settle at that time. Yeah, there are off ramps. So, I mean, we when we file the formal complaints, we request an EOC hearing. We always want to make sure we're doing that with the, you know, we don't want to file something and think that, oh, we're going to settle. We're not actually going to go all the way. But you can change your mind at some point and you can decide, okay, I, I'm going to, you know, this offer for settlement is reasonable. It provides me with compensation. It could be a good way to end this case. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's again, not very black and white where you can, even after you filed uh, or requested a EOC hearing and begun that process, settlement is always a possibility at that time yeah. and can often make, make a lot of sense, sense to do at that time. Yeah. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here and without, you know, revealing like client confidences. Um, can you give us an example, even if it's a sort of an amalgam of cases that you have, have had of a case that did resolve before you had to file, uh, you know, request the hearing officer? Yeah. And so I can actually, and I can kind of give, I guess, a scale of maybe good to bad case, you know, uh, yeah. better to not as, as good um, uh, scenarios. So I've had cases where I've had cases where as we move along, the real expenses that are dealt with a formal, you know, after requesting an EOC hearing, the actual expenses dealt with that hearing kind of become apparent to the client. And so I've had cases where we've been able to still reach resolution that puts the client ahead. They receive compensation. So, for, you know, we were able to get their attorney's fees and some compensation back. It wasn't everything they wanted, but it was essentially kind of the escape hatch settlement, which is, you know, not the best type of settlement you want to have, but one where you can take an off ramp, you can get some compensation, you can end that process without, you know, essentially still being ahead, but without going with the full process because the expenses are, you know, can be quite large. Um, I've had other cases that were more on the more positive side when um, evidence came out um, that was more helpful for our for my client's case. We were actually able to reach a settlement before we got to the EOC hearing just because we we came in with an initial settlement amount and the employer, the agency, wasn't wanting to reach that amount. As more kind of evidence came out, as the report of investigation became more clear, the agency was more willing to come closer to our settlement amount. So we were all... In that case, we didn't reach exactly everything we wanted, wanted in settlement, but that was more of a positive outcome of 
you know, we were able to reach settlement that provided a good amount of compensation. And it was essentially because, you know, the agency knew that this case was going to be a serious case. And a lot of times, you know, even if we, you know, a lot of times, even if we believe that, well, this case is really strong and we have this evidence to move forward, it, it can make sense to just want to settle as long as the settlement's for a good enough that individual, that employee, because there, there are no guarantees with, um, with an EEOC hearing similar to um, similar to litigation, there's no guarantee that the administrative judge is going to find in, our, in your favor, even if the evidence is quite strong there. So I've had cases where, you know, even though we thought we were kind of the upper hand in, in, the, in the litigation or in the EEOC hearing stage, we still decided to settle because the agency was willing to, to provide the compensation that my client was, you know, willing to accept. And that way it avoids the unnecessary expenses that are, that are needed with the EEOC process. So, I've had, I've had kind of those off, off ramps with the EEO pro process, both in the more positive light of it being, okay, well, we have enough evidence that we've really put a lot of leverage on the agency they want to settle. And other cases where clients have kind of realized this is, you know, financially, I just can't really support this anymore. Let's see if we can just find an off ramp. And we, you know, we can still do that. There's no guarantee that you can still do that and reach a settlement amount that is, that provides compensation. So you're not just kind of in the hole of, for all the legal expenses that you've paid. Yeah, and, and I presume that I mean I know I have I presume you have had cases too where the client does end up underwater. You know, like that you come in with a litigation theory and you press forward and it just doesn't shake out that way. Maybe the agency is just intransigent, or you've got an attorney on the other side who's willing to fight a war of attrition, and the government doesn't care, right? I mean that that attorney's getting, getting you know on payroll yeah. no matter what happens in their case. So uh, I'm sure you've probably had some where the client unfortunately has to just throw in the towel because they can't afford to keep going and uh and they're just you know they they're just out that money yeah that does happen and that is kind of speaks to the nature of with i mean you alluded to it Tom, I mean, with with federal government you know federal agencies they're always going to have money they're always going to have you know a system i mean private sectors can have that too but they have to kind of think a little more of their bottom line so agencies can it, it can be kind of that war of attrition which employees, individual employees are always going to be at a disadvantage, you know, somewhat because they won't, you know, they might not have be able to have that infinite resources or the ability to do that. So I've, I've, I have had cases where, you know, clients was effectively had to throw in the towel because of the, those costs. And that's kind of the purpose of what we're talking about today is that those costs can really mount up and can, you know, be significant before you, before you kind of even really realize that. And so it's important to know that ahead of time. And so I've had clients where that's happened. And the goal for me is to see if we can at least reach a settlement so that, okay, well, if the client is not able to move forward, we can at least get some kind of compensation here before having to end the case. And I've been able to do that in some cases, but I have had other cases where the, as you said, the um, agency is really, you know, stuck in their ways and transient and they're not going to want to provide any kind of settlement. It's also more the case just have to be dropped because the only alternative is to press forward and that's going to incur more billing, more time without a real guarantee of being able of, of success. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And, you know, there are, you can tell me your perspective. There are not as, there are some firms we don't generally, there are some firms that offer contingency, you know, uh, arrangement for federal sector cases. That is, you don't, you know, the attorney doesn't get paid unless there is some kind of settlement. Um, but it tends to be somewhat rare uh, in my experience because a, the federal government doesn't, as you say, have the same incentive to settle as they as private sector employers do. That doesn't mean they won't, but they don't have the same incentive to settle. Uh, and uh, there are no, you know, the damages are lower. There are no punitive damages available. You're not going to ring the bell right. and get, you know, uh, a multi million dollar kind of uh, uh, judgment in a federal sector case. So for that reason, you know, most firms, including ours. You know, don't offer contingency fee arrangements. That doesn't mean it's not out there. There are some, but it tends to be fewer than you might find for private for you know attorneys that, that do private sector work. Yeah, and again, that would that kind of is uh, an outreach of that um, incentive structure because with um, contingency representations with um, private uh, employers, as you said, there can be punitive damages. There can be those larger payouts, whereas the Federal sector, the EEO uh, process is pretty rigid in what you can do, like, like um, judgment wise. I believe they have caps. They have like three hundred thousand dollars caps for compensatory damages. So it's it's much more rigid than that. So it, it, because of that, contingency um, uh, representation is less likely in the federal sector because the ultimate payout is you know is 
restricted by those um, uh, standards within the actual yield process itself. And again, I mean, the other point I guess I'd make is, you know, litigation itself, we can take you know, federal litigation or state litigation in the court can take one to three years. But the EEO, the full EEO, EEO process can take just as long, if not maybe even longer, because when you get to the point where you're actually asking for the EEOC hearing, you get to the point where you have an assigned administrative judge, you have discovery, you have the motion for summary judgment, you have the employee's opposition to that motion. That's usually fairly truncated. That probably only takes maybe six months or so, that whole process. But the EEO investigation itself can take six months to a year to get to that point. So I just, I know it's also, it's, it's a longer process and, you know, the EEO, you can get to the point where it's been maybe a year or so and the, and the EEO investigation is just finally ended and you get their report of investigation. I know clients uh, can kind of, employees, they don't really know the full process will think, oh, well, this is kind of the end of the investigation. The investigation's over. I got this report of investigation. I could either request a hearing or a final agency decision, but this means that, you know, the end is kind of near in a sense when it really isn't if you're going forward with an EEOC hearing, because that again starts maybe that six month process from beginning to end of the EEOC hearing. And that's typically the more expensive that, well, that is the more expensive part of the EEO process. So that's also just linked to me aware of for, for federal employees is that it's a, it's, it's, the EEO process is set up to be a little bit more streamlined, but still can take a while. And the area that has more legal work and therefore legal expenses doesn't really happen until after the actual formal investigation has taken place and that EEOC hearing has been requested. Yeah, and, and that, I think that's a good point for folks who are, you know, wanting to sort of play a game of chicken, uh, which is, the, you know, that's a that's a viable you know tactic. Yeah. Right? Let's see how far I can take this and see if the other side's going to blink and offer me some kind of settlement. Um, it is you know, it is possible to do that, but, but, you know, there are pluses and minuses, right? It's in some ways it stinks that it takes sometimes years to, for the process to, you know, run its full course. You know, the upside of that is, is if you're paying for it, as most federal sector workers are, it's not as if you have to come up with that money all at once, right? There's going to be, yeah. you know, there are going to be times when it's really, you know, it's really hot, heavy and expensive. And then there are going to be months sometimes where, where nothing is happening. So, you know, it's both possible to continue and kind of, save up your money if you want to go the full distance. And also, you know, there, during those times, it's always possible that the case can resolve. You know, I think it's just important that the client is really open with their attorney and everybody is having a very kind of brass tacks conversation about like, what is it that you want client out of this litigation process? And, you know, at what point, you know, at, at what point would this not be worth it for you? And, and to continually have that conversation because as you know, it can change depending on the facts yeah. that come in, depending on the client circumstances. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, yeah, I would certainly agree with um, what you're saying about kind of how things can be really, um, I, I describe it as kind of hot and cold. You can have, there can be months where the investigation is going on during the formal investigation and you're really not doing much. So, you know, that is a good time to save up money for the case, but it also means that you're not being billed as much. And so I always want to try to avoid clients getting that mindset of like, oh, well, this is just going to be what it's going to be until this is resolved, until I get a determination. Is it's going to be, you know, kind of a slower burn um, investigation where, you know, it won't be as many large legal fees. But once you get into that EEOC hearing stage and discovery, things really ramp up pretty quickly and it gets into the hot phase where you might have a couple of weeks where the billing in those weeks is going to be more than it was the last three months combined just because of what, what you're doing. Because if there's an investigation going on in the background and we're hearing, we're getting updates from the EEOC, the EEO investigator, we're not really involved, there isn't going to be much billing. But then once that investigation is concluded and an EEOC hearing has been requested, and now we have two weeks to submit discovery requests, we have two weeks after that to then submit responses to the agency's discovery requests, we're then reviewing the agency's motion for summary judgment and then filing opposition. There can be times when in those three or four weeks, the billing is, you know, twice as much as it was the last three months because there was more legal action going on. So I think that is, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, a, that's an important thing to know just because, you know, we always want to know what the client wants and what their goal of the case is. But, you know, as attorneys, it's also good to let the client know that, you know, it might start off kind of start off kind of slow. You know, if we aren't able to reach a, set, a resolution after filing a formal complaint, it's going to be kind of quiet while that investigation takes place. But then that is not going to be the expectation at the end, because if you're trying to go for the full, if you're trying to go the full way, once you ask for that EEOC hearing, 
it's it's essentially full on litigation, and that is going to be you know we at our at the firm have a thirty thousand dollar litigation retainer initial payment, and so that's kind of what you can expect. You know that those amounts to start um, being uh, being used for that litigation because you're doing all the things you would do in a federal court case. You're exchanging discovery. You might be you might be taking depositions. You might be deposed yourself as an employee. You might take depositions of other employees. So there's just, yeah, it's important to know that there is a, uh, an ebb and flow of these investigations so that when it's really quiet, it, do, it doesn't mean that, you know, nothing's happening. It's just all oh, this just behind the scenes. And it also doesn't mean that that's what it's going to be like. It's going to stay like that the same. There'll then be hot periods where, okay, well, you know, now we're going to need more, you know, there's going to be more legal fees here because there's a lot more legal action in the next, in these next two or three weeks versus the last three or four months. So it's, it's always important just to have that conversation between the client and the attorney to let to, so the client knows, okay, well, you know, I might not have to do too much in the next couple of months, but then once uh, the EFC hearing is actually requested, then things are going to ramp up very quickly. I'm going to have to be sure to be on top of that. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you can't answer that, that's fine. But if, if you not, you know, mileage may vary. We're not holding anybody anything. Every firm is different in how they handle this. But what would you say ballpark for sort of a, to, you know, the hypothetical average federal sector case? How much does it cost roughly in each stage? You know, the, the kind of the, the short, right. formal, formal, then into litigation. And understanding the litigation, as we talked about, can happen in in spurts. I mean, you can have times where yeah. just nothing or very little happening, and then you can it gets hot all of a sudden, and there's a lot of work and a lot of billing to be done. I would say in the informal stage, if you include like counseling, at least in my experience, that might be at least for our firm only around like four, five, six thousand dollars to get to that into the informal stage where there's a possible counseling. To get to the formal stage, that's and so that informal stage is probably one of the shorter shortest stages, I believe, because it's I believe it's only it's a certain amount of time. It in might be forty five days. I apologize for not knowing the specific time there, but it's the informal stage is fairly quick and and not super involved because you're just filing formal. And a lot of that can be done without I mean, an attorney. We would be happy to do that at our firm, but you can walk into your agency's EEO office, talk to them, and say I'm being discriminated against based on these these factors, and that can be in your process. So. The informal stage in that counseling is one of the cheaper ones. The formal stage is when things start to get more expensive. I mean, that might be fifty, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars to get through that process because then we're filing an actual formal complaint, which is a longer document. You're then filing um the next step after you file a formal complaint typically is the investigator asking for affidavits. So it's it's a client writing out or either answering questions asked by the the um the investigator or just kind of having a narrative provided the investigator so that, you know, can be expensive. We then receive um, management affidavits, essentially affidavits from agency employees who were sa- or supervisors who the client is saying we are discriminating against. So that, you know, that in, in, uh, takes place there. So the formal stage is closer to maybe fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 total, maybe, maybe more. And that's probably the longest stage, like time-wise, because the investigation, um, EEO investigators uh, essentially have a 180-day deadline to have that investigation be done by. Otherwise, they'll then ask for a uh, one-time extension of 90 days, which does happen sometimes. I've had it happen. doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. So the, the formal stage is the longest stage. Uh, so while it is more expensive in the um, informal stage, the monetary amounts are going to be more spread out there. And then the actual, once you request the EEOC hearing, that's that's lengthwise about medium. It's, it's, it's longer in the informal stage, but not as long as the formal stage. But monetary wise, that's where the bulk of it's going to be. That might be eighty, ninety thousand dollars plus for that stage, just at the you know to get through the entire process. Because depending on you know how much discovery you want to exchange, if you want to take depositions, because depositions cost money to get those transcripts. So that's that's the most expensive stage, and that can typically take you know eighty, ninety thousand dollars to get to that stage end. So it. Each stage kind of builds up mo- uh, money-wise. I just know that the, fo- the investigation stage is likely the longest. That's where the kind of co- that's probably the coldest part of it, where you're not, you know, there isn't a lot going on. There might be some things going back and forth, but you're just kind of waiting. And then the actual hearing stage and that um, that litigation, essentially, that's the hottest stage, both in money-wise and in just things that are happening. Yeah. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and again, you know, mileage may vary, it sort of depends on your case, how complicated it is. You know, we're just talking, and this is our firm, other firms are different, but this is sort of kind of ballpark. So it sounds like 
to get through, you know, if you start with an attorney at the beginning, which there's some advantages to doing, if you start from an attorney at the beginning all the way, you know, through the formal process, we're talking, you know, maybe thirty thousand uh, dollars. Again, not all of, not, you know, you, you're not you're not incurring all those fees at once. Mm -hmm. uh, it's spread out over a certain period of time, and then as we talked about before, the hope is and the opportunity is is that you could settle at any point along that way for more than what you've. You know, hopefully, that's the objective for yeah. more than what you've paid. Uh, you know, paid your, your attorney and. You know, I think another point to to mention is like certainly there are monetary uh, rewards. Like, and everybody would we, all prefer to make more money rather than less. But there are other kinds of relief that you could get. You yes. know, whether it's an accommodation or a transfer or things that you know could be very valuable to you if this is your career and you're early in it and you want to stay in it for the next twenty years, but you can't work for this boss anymore because you know he's harassing you. Well, you know getting you to a different boss that allows you to keep that career longevity can work, be worth hundreds of thousands, even into seven figures to you. So there's those kinds yeah. of strategic things are important too. Yeah. There's always non-monetary terms as well. That can be just as important or more important in some aspects than monetary terms. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think this is a, it's a great information you've given here. And I think the important point is that, you know, as the, as you, the employee, people that are listening to this or watching this, <clears throat> you know, to, to talk with your attorney, to figure out what your objectives are, you know, what sort of, and this, these things can change, right? And as we talked about, this process can take months, sometimes years, but certainly months. Yeah. So we're not locking anybody in, but like what, you know, what are you client? What are you employee? What's important to you about this process? Is it, you know, standing up for yourself? Is it, did you only want to return on your investment, which is totally fine. Is it that you want to return on your investment and you like a transfer? Like, what is it that you are getting out of this? And then constantly being in communication with your attorney about where the process is, you know, where you are on it, what the strength of your case looks out like at any particular time and what the, you know, potential costs are so that you can make a reasoned decision. Sometimes it's worth it, you know, to spend $120,000 plus, you know, to get all the way through the hearing stage. Sometimes yeah. it's not, and that's going to vary from client to client. And I think it's just, it's important that, that as the client, as the employee, you're going in with eyes wide open, um, you know, to what, to what the possibilities and the pitfalls are. Yeah. No, just to have a full awareness that it's not that finder, you know, you don't have to go for the long haul, but if you want to, it will, you know, it will be a, quite a climb, but there's, you can, you know, there's ways you can kind of have an off ramp if you want that, but just, yeah. Being going in there with uh, with full knowledge is, is is essential, just so you know what what to expect, so things aren't a surprise when certain things happen. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Mike. I appreciate you spending some time with us today, and I will let you jump off while I do the the outro here. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us here at the Spiegel Law Firm podcast. I hope you found this helpful. If you'd like more of this type of information, please go to our site the careerrocket.io, where if you give us your email weekly, you will get a no cost email to you, chock full of the latest and greatest in employment law and other tips and tricks to help you keep your career on an upward trajectory. And of course, you can always go to our website, spigalaw.com, where we have a lot of information on employment law so you are fully informed. Thanks so much and good luck out there. Mm -hmm.